Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to the Siege of Vrax. We will be staying in the Void for this episode, looking at the end of the first Void battle for the Vraxian system. Rear Admiral Reziak, in charge of the Imperial Navy defense elements above Vrax, had made a valiant effort to prevent the Chaos forces from passing him by unmolested. The Chaos Heavy Transport Aron's Bane had suffered damage in the initial Void engagement, and was later rammed and plunged into the Vraxian atmosphere by one of Rear Admiral Raziek's three fireships, whilst the other two sadly failed to inflict any real damage. So far, the Chaos Fleet had only suffered minor damage via the loss of Infidel and Iconoclast Raider ships, all of their capital ships were still intact. Meanwhile, on the Imperial side, they had lost two defense monitors and two sword class frigates, along with all three of the fire ships, of which only one had succeeded in doing damage. But things were looking up for the Imperial Navy, as reinforcements had so recently arrived, in the form of cruiser group Mazur, under the command of Rear Admiral Mazur. With three cruisers, he was set to tip the tide of battle, but he was heading straight towards the Anarchy's Heart, the despoiler-class battleship that even now was approaching a low orbit above Vrax to deploy its reinforcements. The Rear Admiral aimed to destroy this mighty vessel when it was at its most vulnerable, sitting stationary and unable to defend itself or maneuver effectively in low orbits above the planet. The bagging of such a mighty prey would not only be very fine reading indeed in the Rear Admiral's reports, but might also take the courage out of the Chaos Fleet in its entirety. It would not be the first time that a larger Chaos raiding fleet had been turned back after the loss of their leader. Chaos raiders, after all, are almost always a somewhat ragtag bunch, and with the loss of their immediate leadership, they tend to find more interesting things to occupy their time. Like, for example, quarreling with one another about who should be the next leader. But of course, destroying the Despoiler class was easier said than done, and in the current situation, it was going to be even more difficult still. Cruiser Group Mazur had already been reduced to two out of three cruisers, and they had also peeled off their squadron of sword class escorts to engage the two Chaos cruisers that had attempted to intercept Cruiser Group Mazur. The ship that had been peeled off to engage the two Chaos cruisers was the Dictator class Orion, along with Patrol Squadron Naris, consisting of three Sword class frigates. This should be more than enough to throw a few wrenches in the wheels of the Chaos cruisers. The Dictator class is armed with a Nova Cannon, a weapon with exceptional range and destructive power. If only the Orion could land one, maybe two hits on the incoming cruisers, it could permanently take one of them out of the fight quite easily. The last cruiser would then have to face the Dictator along with the three Sword class frigates. If everything went well, the Orion and Patrol Squadron Naris should at the very least be able to chase off the two Chaos cruisers, and possibly even destroy or cripple one or even both of them. Meanwhile, Rear Admiral Raziek, still aboard the battered and bruised Lord Bellerophon, was desperately trying to get some form of communications back online, so that he could communicate with the rest of his fleet and, via them, communicate with Rear Admiral Mazur, and inform him about the rather unfortunate state of Rear Admiral Raziek's flotilla, and whether or not he could reinforce the cruiser group. At the moment, Lord Bellerophon was not doing particularly well. Its Void Shield generators were still all out of commission, one out of its weapons decks was still burning, but it still had at the very least some form of power. And assuming the engine seers could reroute enough power to boost the thrusters, as well as activating the weapons and maybe even getting the Void Shields back online, 
the Lord Bellerophon could still stand in the line of battle. At the very least, that was the plan until a massive explosion rocked through the superstructure of the Lunar class cruiser. A torpedo, as of yet undetected by the Lord Bellerophon's orgas, had struck the ship's rear quarters, destroying what remained of its thrusters. It proved impossible to determine precisely where the torpedo had come from. It could have been a speculative long-range shot that had gone unnoticed, or it could simply have been a torpedo that drifted into the middle of what remained of the Lord Bellerophon's flotilla. Considering the beating the Lord Bellerophon itself and the rest of the vessels had received when passing by the Chaos Fleet, it was hardly a surprise that their augers were less than fully operational. Regardless of how it had happened, the unfortunate fact still remained. With the last of its main thrusters reduced to so much molten slag, the Lord Bellerophon was effectively crippled and immobile, having to rely entirely on small maneuvering thrusters. The ship could still potentially turn to face a threat, but it would not be moving from its spot in the void anytime soon. And since this would leave the venerable vessel essentially defenseless if any of the Chaos vessels decided to turn around for another torpedo volley, it couldn't very well dismiss its escort crafts either. The defense monitor, single remaining sword class frigate, and the two armed freighters were now going to be the only things keeping the Lord Bellerophon alive. And in all due honesty, the only one of these vessels that had enough speed and firepower to possibly affect the battle elsewhere would have been this single sword class, which hardly would have mattered much anyway. It was, in all due honesty, probably safer to keep them all near the Lunar class vessel, ensuring that the ship at least wasn't completely destroyed. This, of course, was, however, not much in the way of comfort, for the commander aboard the Orion, who, after firing his Nova cannon several times against the incoming cruisers, had been unable to land a single solid hit. This was far from unusual. The Nova cannon is a temperamental weapon designed to be fired at fleet-sized formations, but nevertheless, it was rather disappointing, since now the Orion and its three sword class frigates would have to contend with two virtually unscathed cruisers instead of the one they had hoped to have to deal with. And a bad situation was swiftly replaced by a much worse one, as one sword class frigate was literally cut in half by a lucky long range las blast. The second was reduced to a drifting hulk after being subjected to waves upon waves of chaos bomber attacks, leaving virtually all of her decks bare and open to the void. Suddenly, the Orion found itself the sole recipient of the two Chaos cruisers' attention, as they chose to simply ignore the last remaining sword-class frigate. A squadron of these small vessels can present quite the threat even to a cruiser. The three smaller ships dipping and ducking in and out of the larger ship's gun range whilst firing at the larger ship from several different angles, threatening to destroy its engines, its weapon batteries, its bridge, or strip it of point defense turrets. A single sword class frigate, however, could safely be ignored until the larger dictator class cruiser had been dealt with. And whilst the Dictator is a fairly hefty ship, with plenty of weapon batteries of its very own both for long-range and close-range battles, it was now facing two ships, and they were both of roughly equal tonnage to the Orion. And the Orion had no support. Considering how bright things were looking at the beginning of this fight, the situation certainly had soured rather dramatically. The captain of the Orion continued the fight for a while longer, until he was completely convinced that the two Chaos cruisers were fully committed to fighting his vessel, at which point he requested permission to exit from the battle. 
permission that Rear Admiral Mazur granted, realizing that it would not benefit him over much to lose the Orion. And now that both of the Chaos cruisers were fully engaged, there was no chance of them intercepting his two remaining cruisers. The Orion had made sure to keep enough distance between itself and the Chaos vessels for it to disengage at any point. And so the ship went dark. All active augers were turned to passive, the ship was placed in a blackout state, and all weapon batteries were ordered to cease firing. The last remaining sword class escort did likewise. And now the Chaos cruisers could only rely on their own active augers to locate the Imperial vessels. A daunting task as space is not only vast, it is also filled with interference. And trying to find a target that does not wish to be found in tens of thousands of kilometers of vast, empty, radiation-washed space is not easy. The Orion and its single remaining escort were certainly not out of danger yet. It would take a long period of slow, quiet and steady progression for them to fully escape the two Chaos cruisers' search area, but they certainly had a hell of a lot better chance now than if they had continued the fight. Elsewhere, however, another Imperial vessel was not so lucky. The armed freighter, the Isra Moors, which had, after being immobilized, decided to continue firing upon the Chaos vessels, was now under attack by the Chaos heavy cruiser, the Blood Dawn, who was launching assault crafts against the immobilized freighter. The master of the Blood Dawn had clearly decided that with the loss of the Chaos heavy transport, the Aron's Bane, they would need a new mass transportation vessel, and the Isra Moors fit that bill perfectly. And despite mounting a valiant resistance, the crew of the Isra Moors were not able to resist the Chaos Raiders invading through its hull. Hordes of screaming traitors, beastmen and even Chaos Space Marines invaded the armed frigates. The crew, mostly consisting of civilian deckhands, fought with whatever improvised weaponry they could get their hands on, side by side with the Imperial Navy officers that had been seconded to the Isra Moors from the Lord Bellerophon and her escort vessels. At the end, the captain and the rest of his crew made a desperate last stand on the freighter's bridge. They welded shut the doors and fired at anything that tried to get through after it had been blasted off its hinges. But after a short and ultimately futile struggle, the bridge was captured by screaming hordes of mutated monstrosities. The next time the Isra Moors was spotted, it had undergone a rather drastic change in appearance and crew. The only thing that remained of its old allegiance was the desecrated corpse of its captain, nailed to the vessel's bridge by massive iron spikes. On the bright side, the Lord Bellerophon had regained the ability to communicate with the rest of the vessels in this flotilla. Kinda. It was able to blink its running lights and so communicate crude ideas to the other ships which still had the ability to communicate over long-range Vox. Now, granted, flashing lights are neither the most advanced nor necessarily the most nuanced means of communications possible in the 41st millennium, but after the Lord Bellerophon had pretty much the entirety of its communication facilities blasted off during the first engagement with the incoming Chaos forces, it was better than the alternative since the alternative was nothing. And thusly, through the magic of blinking lights, Rear Admiral Razik managed to communicate to the rest of his flotilla that they were to contact Rear Admiral Mazur and inform him that he could not expect any further assistance from the Lord Bellerophon or the rest of its flotilla. The message was necessarily kept short and blunt, not necessarily explaining why the Rear Admiral could not expect any further assistance, 
This was, of course, primarily due to the nature of the communication. Again, flashing lights appeared to be somewhat lacking in, well, nuance. Necessary or not, however, this was to have some rather severe consequences, because when Rear Admiral Mazur received the message, he assumed that Rear Admiral Raziak had abandoned him. As mentioned in the last video, there was absolutely no love lost between the two Rear Admirals, and in more peaceful times they would undoubtedly have relished any and all opportunity to take a few shots at one another. Therefore, it is not entirely unreasonable for Mazur to assume the worst of his long-time rival. However, this changed things rather drastically. The Anarchy's heart had already descended into the upper atmosphere of Vrax and had begun to deploy its reinforcements. It would therefore no longer be possible for Rear Admiral Mazur to intercept the Chaos Flotilla before it deployed the majority of its troops onto the Vraxian surface. Mazur had, however, still been clinging to the idea that he might be able to bring down the Despoiler. In such a vulnerable position as it was, hanging in low orbit, it would not require much in the way of damage for the ship to be rendered immobile, and therefore claimed by the gravity of the planet below. The ship would also be severely limited and hindered in its ability to bring its full firepower to bear, as well as manoeuvring out of the way of any incoming ordnance. If Mazur would have been able to rely upon the support of the Lord Bellerophon or the Orion, he would still have had a pretty good chance of bagging himself at a spoiler. But now that his fleet had effectively been reduced to two ships, his own Council Thracii and the Covenanter, the odds of a successful attack run had reached virtually zero. In fact, the captain of the Covenanter had already arrived at this conclusion, and urged the rear admiral to break off the attack run, so that at the very least the two remaining cruisers could be saved. Rear Admiral Mazur had to admit that the odds were astronomical, and so he dispatched a message to the Covenanter instructing it to break off from the attack, and retreat away to a safe distance where it could regroup and hopefully join up with further Imperial Navy reinforcements. He also instructed the captain of the Covenanter to send a message to the Imperial Navy Board of Inquiry on Cypra Monday. Because Rear Admiral Mazur would not be joining the Covenanter, he would take his Council Thracii on a suicide run towards the Anarchy's heart, in a bid to ram it. If the Gothic-class cruiser could manage to strike the Anarchy's heart, the Chaos Vessel's fate would be as good as sealed. Even if the collision didn't rend the mighty vessel in half, stationary as it was above Vrax, the impact would surely send it plummeting into the atmosphere. Of course, the Council of Thraishi would also be guaranteed a less than pleasant fate, but what was mere death compared to the eternal glory the ship and its admiral would gain from destroying such a foe? But before glory, there is always duty, and Mazur was convinced that Rear Admiral Raziak had betrayed him, and so along with the Covenanter, he sent a request that Rear Admiral Raziak be stripped of all rank, privilege, and honour that he be charged with treason, dereliction of duty, incompetence and cowardice in the face of the enemy. In light of these inexcusable actions and the irrefusable evidence presented by the Rear Admiral Raziak's refusal to render aid, Rear Admiral Mazur requested the Board of Inquiry to render upon the Rear Admiral its ultimate sanction. Death by hanging. And so, with his duty completed, Admiral Mazur continued on his course of action to ram the Anarchy's heart. There was only one little problem, 
The Anarchy's heart was currently sitting above the Vraxian Citadel, meaning that the Council Thraci would have to pass across virtually every single defense battery on Vrax, whilst also passing through the engagement range of the Anarchy's heart itself and virtually every single other ship that had come with it to the planet. And considering that only about four Chaos ships were actively occupied at the time, that still meant that something along the lines of a dozen plus warships could draw a bead upon the Council Thraci. Now granted, most of them would be light vessels or possibly even transports, but still, that is an awful lot of guns. And the Council Thraci was soon taking fire from every conceivable direction. And in the end, the Council Thraci, buffeted from every which way by endless volleys of lance and macro cannon batteries, barely made it halfway towards the Anarchy's heart, before its engines were literally shorn from the vessel. It was engulfed in fire, and a report by one of the few survivors suggested that even until the very end, Rear Admiral Mazur remained on the bridge. A junior officer was reported to have tried to drag him away to one of the escape pods, but the Rear Admiral had refused. And as far as anyone knows, he was still on the bridge when it disintegrated. Was Rear Admiral Mazur's actions the height of bravery, or the height of folly? It is difficult to tell, in fact, the naval cadets at Cypramundi would discuss this subject for many, many decades to come. Personally, considering that this led to the loss of the only capital-class vessel in the entire fight, I'd probably be leaning towards the latter. And it had certainly been an expensive engagement for the Imperial Navy. They had lost four out of six sword-class frigates, they had lost two out of three defense monitors, and out of their three armed freighters, they had lost one, and not just lost it, it had been captured by the enemy. Out of the fire ships, all three were of course destroyed, but only one succeeded in inflicting any damage, sending the Chaos Heavy Transport the Aron Spain plunging down into the Vraxian atmosphere, where unfortunately it survived mostly intact. The Imperial Navy had also suffered heavily amongst its capital class ships. Out of a total of four cruisers, only one had escaped almost entirely unscathed, that being the Dominator, which had broken off its attack on the Anarchy's heart, and had escaped with only minor damages after having been pursued momentarily by light Chaos vessels. As for the other three cruisers, the Council Thraci was, of course, destroyed whilst attempting to ram the Anarchy's heart. It had now been reduced to a drifting hulk in orbit above the planet of Vrax. The Orion had been driven off and badly mauled by the two Chaos cruisers it had intercepted to prevent their own interception of the Council Thraci and the Covenator. As for the flagship of Rear Admiral Raziak, the Lord Bellerophon would spend several years in a void dock before she could be returned to active service. A service that her captain would never see again. Whilst Rear Admiral Mazur had paid for his folly with his life, his last message, born aboard the Covenator, would ensure that Rear Admiral Raziak would pay for his actions or perceived lack of actions with his career, although he did at the very least avoid the noose. The first avoid battle of Vrax had resulted in a decisive chaos victory. For the loss of a mere four light vessels, iconoclast and infidel class raiders, and one heavy freighter, they had destroyed four enemy frigates, captured a heavy freighter, and destroyed a capital class cruiser vessel.
But of course, the true prize lay in the fact that the Chaos Flotilla now had complete control of the Vraxian system and could deploy their reinforcements in peace and quiet. The Blood Dawn would deploy yet more Dreadclaw assault pods full of cornate berserkers, hailing from the berserkers of Skalthrax and the Skulltaker's warband of the cornet warmaster Zafor the Blood Reaver. And in addition to these Chaos Astartes reinforcements also came a full warband of Iron Warriors, unloading from their own ship the Ferrum Invictus. And the Iron Warriors did not come merely as additional warriors to the cause of the Cardinal. Many of the Iron Warriors were veterans of the Long War. Having served under Petarabo themselves, they had a near unparalleled grasp of siege warfare, both how to wage it offensively and defensively. They would set about refining, upgrading and reinforcing the Vraxian defences, and so, fortifications that had already taken the Death Corps years upon years and hundreds of thousands of casualties to breach would now become even stronger. But the Astartes reinforcements were by no means the only strength now flowing into the defenders of Vrax. Besides two warbands of Cornet Berserkers, one of Iron Warriors, and a smaller assorted number of worshippers of Nurgle, they also brought with them tens of thousands of additional soldiers. Although soldier may be a somewhat generous term to use for the hordes of screaming, gibbering madmen, traitors, and mutants that now flowed down to the planet's surface. These troops were considerable in number, maybe even in excess of a hundred thousand, but at the very least they would measure in the tens of thousands. And whilst these fighters would be of wildly varying quality, all the way from the Iron Warriors down to mindless gibbering beasts, their numbers represented a much needed replenishment to the rapidly dwindling manpower pool of Vrax. And due to the peculiar nature of the armament world, it also could make up for one of the primary shortcomings of chaotic hordes like the one that had come to their rescue. One of the primary drawbacks of such chaos forces is often a severe lack of heavy materiel and supplies. But since the traitors on Vrax still had access to all of the underground armories, this shortcoming could be easily rectified. The other shortcoming would be somewhat more difficult. As you can probably imagine, Chaos Hordes are rarely a unified entity. Every warband has its own leader, every ship has its own captain who is the de facto leader of his vessel, but the various warbands carried aboard said vessel need not necessarily be under his command. A great Chaos Horde, like the one descending upon Vrax, is essentially a huge ragtag band of ever-shifting alliances and bonds of fealty. And these bonds, it is important to point out, is usually based upon fear of one or more parties of the treaty rather than any real sense of loyalty. To put it rather bluntly, Chaos Warbands very rarely play well with others, and can only be enticed into doing so by fear of the repercussions should they not behave themselves. And this rather fluid command structure was going to clash rather violently with the Vraxian command structure, which for all of its flaws was still primarily based upon the idea of a fixed chain of command in the Imperial style. Granted, they had the occasional independent element, such as, for example, the Disciples of Saifen, who acted outside of and beyond the command structure, but by and large it was still a recognisable military structure. These differences of opinion would undoubtedly come to cause some issues further down the line, but for the moment the Vraxians were undoubtedly just happy to be rescued no matter the nature of their rescuers. But of course, these reinforcements were not the only change. Oh no, not at all. 
The fact was that up until this point, the Imperial Navy had maintained full void superiority over the Vraxian system, with all of the various benefits that this entailed. They could bring in reinforcements and supplies whenever and wherever they wished. It also allowed the Death Corps to limit themselves to a fixed front line, since the enemy had no way of relocating troops that did not rely on ground-based vehicles or good old-fashioned marching. With the introduction of not only the loss of Imperial Void Supremacy, but the gain of Chaos Void Supremacy, this all changed rather drastically, since now not only could the Raxian defenders potentially be transported up into orbit then placed anywhere else on the planet, it also introduced an element that so far had been almost entirely lacking in the Vraxian theatre. Air power. At the start of the conflict, the defenders had none, and so the attackers reasoned that it would be a waste of resources to bring over much in the way of their own air forces. They brought along with them a few squadrons just in case, but all of these had been stationed aboard the Lord Bellerophon, and had been fully engaged in the Void Battle above Vrax. Thusly, despite the technical existence of Imperial Aeronautica forces in the Vraxian system, none of them were actually on the planet, leaving the Death Corps essentially without any form of aerial support. The Chaos Fleet, however, now that it had complete Void Superiority, could deploy their fleet assets as they wished. And since, once again, the Death Corps had come to Vrax assuming literally nothing in the way of aerial activity, they had only brought along a small quantity of anti-aircraft defences, and hell, they were encouraged to bring along none, but luckily for the attackers, the Death Corps of Krieg never does anything by half measures, and so they had brought along enough in the way of anti-air artillery to secure their own positions. They had also, despite protests by the Lord Commander, by the way, erected shield generators over their primary starports, something they could now be very, very thankful of indeed. Because if these facilities did not exist, then the starport, through which the Death Corps received all of their reinforcements and supplies, not to mention where they stored the vast quantities of these resources, would have been bombed out of existence the moment the Chaos Fleet arrived in orbit. Once again, the paranoia of the Men of Krieg had served them supremely well, as they were able to weather what very easily could have been a shattering blow. They were also de facto immune to any orbital bombardments launched against them from the Chaos Fleet. The simple fact was that the Men of Krieg were simply just too close to the Vraxian defences, and any attempt at orbital bombardment launched by the Chaos Flotilla would be almost guaranteed to wipe out just as many Vraxians as Krieg Guardsmen. And whilst the followers of the Ruinous Powers are rarely overly bothered about the fate of their subordinates, the potential complete annihilation of both their own forces along with the enemy was a bit much, even by their standards. If the Death Corps were still entrenched along the second or outer line of defences, then maybe they would have risked it, but as it was, any orbital bombardment risked not only the wholesale slaughter of Raxian defenders, but there was also a very real possibility that the macro cannon barrage would find its way into the underground storage bunkers beneath Vrax which would leave the eventual prize of the planet a hell of a lot poorer. Now, of course, this would not prevent the Chaos Flotilla from the occasional light harassing orbital bombardment, mind you, not firing their main macro cannon batteries, but smaller ordnance, maybe the occasional relatively precise lance strike, for example. But this was nothing compared to the devastation the fleet above could have inflicted upon the loyal armies of the Imperium if they'd had a clear shot. But even though the Death Corps had avoided 
at the very least instantaneous annihilation, their situation had gotten a hell of a lot more complicated, especially as the Chaos Forces caught the Death Corps of Krieg in the middle of an offensive. Yes. You might have been wondering what had been going on on the planet below, well, Lord Commander Zhulka had been up to his usual... brilliance. But we'll get to that in a couple of episodes. First, in the next episode, I want to talk about the Chaos Reinforcements to give you a clear idea of exactly who, and why, these people have come to Vrax to make the Death Corps' life so much more miserable. Or, well, in terms of Death Corps ways of looking at things, they are probably happy, since their opportunities to sacrifice themselves in the name of the Emperor had just multiplied greatly. Anywho, until next time, I have been Arch, thank you all very much for watching, if you enjoyed it, please do consider sharing it around, and until next time, have a good day.